We continue with the fundamentally Capilanian subject of peoplehood. We're going to have three very different uh, papers all around that theme. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Rabbi Bob Gluck. Good afternoon. Um, I, I just want to start with a little anecdote. 34 years ago, I was lying on the beach at Cape Cod, and I had three books with me. Um, one was Heschel, one was Buber, and one was Judaism as a Civilization. And I spent the whole week not swimming, but reading Judaism as a Civilization. There was a problem with that, though, which is that I had just been accepted at, um, it was a law school, and I think it's uh, O'Hare. And, uh, but then I had read Judaism and Civilization, and um, at, at what ensued was two letters. One was to RSC, which I had applied to then in response, saying, yes, I'm coming. And the other one was to Georgetown Law School saying, keep my $100 deposit. <laughs> so here's what I read when I was on the beach. And what it, what it showed me was that Kaplan um, viewed the arts as having uh, a profoundly central place in um, his envisioned renaissance of uh, Jewish peoplehood. Because uh, for Kaplan, the aesthetic engagement of the senses served an important function, which was to capture the imagination of the members of a group, to embody and vividly bring to life its collective values and symbols, to help every individual in that group see her or himself as, as an integral part of the history and experience of that group, and here's what he wrote that I read on the beach. The art of a civilization is its individual interpretation of the world in color, sound, and image, an integration that is familiar and profoundly interesting to the people of that civilization. This art contributes a unique expressive value to each object of the spiritual life of that people. And as somebody who is a pianist and a community activist, I read that and went, got to go to that school. In his 1948 work, the one that he apparently didn't like, um, Future of the American Jew, which I agree also was the best of them, uh, Kaplan, or his second best, we'll see. Kaplan looked forward to the long overdue flowering of creativity in the domain of um, new Jewish cultural values where the art supreme, I'm, I'm sorry, no, okay, this is a quote. He looked forward to, quote, the long overdue flowering of creativity in the domain of the new Jewish cultural values where the arts reign supreme. This is the area in which it should be possible to render Jewish life visibly, audibly, tangibly beautiful and fascinating. For the development of the arts, we need the best that the most gifted of our sons and daughters can contribute. Kaplan's imaginative vision represented a tall order for people that Kaplan himself saw as disengaged, dispirited, ignorant of the heritage, and disinterested in the arts. He expressed frustration when he wrote in The Meaning of God in Jewish Religion, which is my second favorite book of those, um, quote, the very attempt to abstract Jewish religion from all the other aspects of Jewish life shows a woeful misunderstanding of the vital and organic relationship between religion and the other elements of a civilization, implicitly meaning including the arts. Here Kaplan speaks as you know, the, the sociologist or maybe anthropologist that he's known to be, um, speaking really of traditional societies where what we in the modern West call art doesn't really exist. Rather, it's integrated into the rituals of daily life as people work, celebrate, mourn with singing, dance, drama, and other forms of expression. At the same time, Kaplan recognized that a modern conception of art was in tension with that, because it represented more the creative impulse of individuals than artisans working on behalf of the collective. As a religious trans-supranaturalist theologian, <laughs> you're, we'll take a vote. Okay. Uh, Kaplan impaired the individual artist by reframing the idea of God as creator, and this was mentioned by Mel before, to mean that creativity itself is divine. And in Meaning of God, he wrote, quote, the artist is the human being as creator par excellence. Out of a block of stone with a chisel, out of some grains of colored earth with a brush, or out of a few disparate sounds, the artist can fashion an environment of culture and <coughs> spiritual illumination. And I'll correct the gender language here. It is in what 
a person, an individual, creates that that person's personality finds its complete fulfillment. Kaplan either modified or balanced this statement by writing, quote, art also has reached, has always reached its heights when it was the expression of a social life. And here's the zinger. The, quote, decadence of modern art is largely due to the fact that it is no longer the expression of the community spirit, as it was, for example, in the Middle Ages, but has been made an accessory to the, quote, conspicuous consumption of the wealthy. Kaplan may anticipate the high-heeled consumerism of the 21st century art marketplace, but here he casts a negative light on what many of us would refer to as the triumphs of 20th century art. Is it not true that many of us find a holiness in modern art irrespective of whether it has a connection to conventional religious or communal functions? We hear Kaplan's ambivalence about these questions later in the same volume where he writes, quote, to produce art is, the crea is to be creative, to give new meaning to reality. Since the expression of value in life constitutes our knowledge of God, all sincere art is creative. In the past, religion emphasized the beauty of holiness. Modern religion must also emphasize the holiness of beauty. It's from the uh, meaning of God. Maybe this is a balance between Bildung, as Mel spoke about it, um, with the communal spirit. But I also think that Kaplan's anxiety is partly rooted in his observation as early as the 1920s that the arts were exerting a far stronger pull on modern Jews than was traditional Judaism. And that's given voice in um, a passage in uh, Judaism as a Civilization where he wrote, modern aestheticism, although it has no great direct bearing on abstract conceptions of God, has become so enlarged in scope and enriched in content that it offers a far greater variety of opportunities for the satisfaction of the human spirit than the limited range of beliefs and practices identified as traditional Judaism. In reality, Kaplan was only mildly informed about the arts in practice. Being one who liked what he liked and resisted much else and relied largely on his daughter Judith. She was a musician who studied at the Institute of, of Musical Arts, later the Juilliard School of Music. In his journals from the late 1920s, Kaplan's really very frank about uh, his own um, knowledge base and experience. And I really thank Mel Skolt for um, his, the, Mel, Mel will be the, um, not, uh, he'll, he'll have delivered all the goods I asked for, but the choice of what materials I'm about to read to you were mine. So you can throw tomatoes at me for this one. So Kaplan speaks self-critically, very self-critically, in his journals. Um, once, upon visiting uh, the studio of Israeli artist Ryan Reuven, Kaplan wrote that he prefers, quote, his landscapes more than his portraits, which are done in what I believe to be an impressionistic style, meaning not as realism. I confess I am a consummate am haaretz, an ignoramus, in matters musical and aesthetic. Kaplan refers to his, in his words, uncultivated taste when it comes to sculpture after visiting the studio of uh, Enrico Gleisenstein. And he confesses, quote, once in a great while, I escaped to a movie picture palace to come, only to come out even more bored and vexed than before. Vaudeville holds my attention somewhat. I enjoy the occasional dialogue, articulate clever thought, a repartee than more than anything else in the arts. For that matter, any kind of skill captivates me. I don't even want to touch that last sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly 25 years later, after going to a concert that included several works by his daughter Judith, he wrote, I have no musical knowledge whatsoever. It may be that Kaplan's being modest, but these being his private journals, he's just acknowledging his limitations. Certainly any time that Kaplan spent at the theater or at a museum was just taking time away from what mattered to him most, which was his writing, his teaching, and his speaking. What Kaplan did care about was that Jewish ritual deserved aesthetic treatment. In Judaism as a Civilization, he wrote, 
quote, in organizing public worship, the aim should be to utilize as much as possible of poetry, music, song, drama, and the dance. In his subsequent book, no, the one I mentioned that he didn't like, he observed, the embellishment of houses of worship, craftsmanship and the production of objects of ritual significance, the development of liturgical poetry and music, all attest to the urge to give aesthetic expression to religious motifs. The realization of those, these ideas, however, was no simple matter. In the early 1930s, the synagogue that Kaplan had founded in 1922, the SAJ, commissioned at their rabbi's strong urging a large mural in the sanctuary. And here I am um, uh, thankful for my colleague Deborah Waxman, who co-authored an interesting article about this. Um, the mural was called Elements of Palestine Old and New. It was a three-panel mural. It was painted by Jewish artist Tamima Nimtsowitz, later Ghazari, whose son is on the board of Hashem Hatzair. Um, Nimtsowitz, Kaplan's former student at the JTS Teachers Institute, was influenced by politically engaged Mexican painter muralist Diego Rivera. In Rabbi Waxman and Joyce Norton's article, they describe it as um, a distinctly and for some controversially figurative and a figurative work which has secular content. And it, the content was a labor Zionist vision of pioneers. Mind you, this was a mural in where? Despite the lukewarm response of members, some of whom were influential, Kaplan championed the mural as a dual symbol of the role of Zionism and of what he wrote, uh, a vigorous arts program that was needed to promote the revitalization of Judaism. Eventually, the work, which was dedicated in 1935, was then moved to the social hall during the redesign of the sanctuary. SAJ members, though uniformly affirmed that their synagogue was fundamentally a musical place. Uh, noted musicologist A.Z. Eelson was their first uh, cantor, 1922, briefly, probably informally, maybe for six months, but he was followed by the 46-plus year tenure of Moshe Nathanson. Judith Kaplan Eisenstein, in an interview shortly before she died, recalled that, quote, we at the SAJ were a singing congregation right from the start, and it stayed that way. The volunteer choir sang certain parts of the service, and other parts the congregation sang. We never gave up the congregational singing. That turned out to be a very good thing for us. When people got tired of the choir, they moved back into the congregation, but they would always keep singing they would still be singing along with the choir, so everybody was singing. It was really quite exceptional. And I'll, I'm looking at the clock and seeing that I'm not going to talk about how their choir was organized by uh, Nehemia Vinever. Um, <coughs> and the person who really nudged this along was Ira Eisenstein, you know, who was Kaplan's protege, successor, collaborator, and of course, future son-in-law and it was along with um, that troika of, of Nathanson's, Einstein, and Kaplan that they organized that formal Shabbat, two-hour Shabbat service that included music as a rich part of the um, whole experience of, of Shabbat worship. Uh, and, and Judith also recalled that the congregation organized uh, concerts and Jewish arts festivals outside of the services. Anecdotally, what Kaplan wrote in his 1940 diary with reference to the choir, what a pity that so important a field as Jewish religious music should be permitted to go to waste, and so excellent an opportunity to develop Jewish aesthetic values as afforded by the organization of Jewish choruses. What a stupid people we are. <laughs> the Judith Kaplan, Ira Eisenstein courtship began with a collaboration on a musical show, Punch in Judaism. And you have to get the triple, the triple uh, entendre, uh, one of which I, I know who Judy was, but I don't know who Punch was. You can guess. Um, and uh, Ira was the lyricist, Judith was composer, and Ira wrote in his autobiography that the work was designed to feature young actors from the SAJ performed at the 92nd Street Y. Of course, the couple married in 1934 around the release of that first book. Um, and they continued their collaboration through the 40s with five cantatas, you know, some kids. Um, in 1990, though, um, I was the uh, acting dean of students at the college uh, and otherwise 
uh, the movement's outreach director. And um, uh, the Eisenstein had not been at the college in several years, and I, I kind of I was close to them, so I twisted both, well, all four of their arms uh, to come back to the college. And they came during a college time um, series on spirituality, that S word that was referred to earlier. Um, and during this open forum that they agreed to be part of, um, uh, one person questioned them about the supposed intellectual environment of the SAJ, and here's what Ira responded in exasperation. He said, and this is a rough quote, I do have it on tape, by the way. For goodness sake, we were singing all the time. What do you think we were doing? <laughs> what the Eisensteins meant was that the experience of singing at services in that kind of integral way that I described far transcended the literal fact of singing but extended to a much deeper, more internal yet collective experience, one that in 1990 might have been characterized by that word, you know, S-P-I-R, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> one point of frustration for Kaplan that was that there was little partnership between Jewish institutions, which didn't seem to be interested in art, and Jewish artists, who didn't seem to be very engaged in Jewish life. Kaplan wrote, quote, we have highly talented Jews in all the fields of art, and music, drama, dance, painting, sculpture, and architecture, but most of our people still lack the understanding that unless these arts begin to function in Jewish life, there can be no Jewish life in the diaspora. He held out the positive hope that, quote, if many artists who now view Jewish life as dull and drab would develop a new interest in Judaism, then they might discover in it new emotional experiences that would goad them to artistic expression. Shirley Kaplan realized that a concrete plan would be needed if you wanted to bear any fruit. So he added, but the element of artistic creativity cannot be left completely to spontaneous achievement. It's a plant that must be carefully and tenderly nurtured. That was back in Judaism as a civilization. As a forum for experimentation of the arts, the SAJ provided a fascinating balance between art created by professionals and participational art for everyone. The two are not the same. As I said, the two are not the same. Kaplan reconciled the two by suggesting that skilled artists could create works in which the general populace could participate. And that's something that Judith really championed. But much work on the highest artistic level is neither populist nor participational. And not all work that is populist and participational is on a high artist le artistic level which was a point that Judith continually made. Contemporary trend is now to consider the role of synagogue music as fundamentally participational, as engagement and inspiration for people who may not be well educated in nor captivated by the language of the liturgy or the format of conventional services. I would imagine that Kaplan and the Eisensteins would continue to see the artistic and the participational as two sides of an aspirational balance act. In our own day, the plethora of Jewish artists, 30 more seconds. <laughs> Mom. In our own day, a plethora of Jewish artists create work with Jewish content. Jewish institutional life does a reasonable job supporting populist, collectively engaging art, but truly forwardly reaching art continues to receive short shrift. On one hand, Jews as individuals continue to be the forefront of the farthest reaches of the worlds of art, music, dance, film, and multimedia. On the other hand, Jews appear to collectively and institutionally support work that is generally the most comfortable familiar, often the most conservative, although there are exceptions. The decline during the past decade of both the Foundation for Jewish Culture in New York and the Center for Jewish Culture and Creativity in Los Angeles is symptomatic of the impediments facing a broad realization of Kaplan's vision that would place the arts at the center of a renewed Jewish life. Today, Kaplan's optimism, and he was optimistic as people have been saying, continues to inspire challenge and maybe rebuke. When we recall his observation, and it's really 65 years back now in Future of the American Jew, that we are, quote, only at the very beginning in the process of creating a modern Jewish art. Thank you. No, that's fine. Um, I know. Thanks, Bob. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Zach Braderman.
So uh, I'll just say that uh, the best uh, Kaplan books are uh, Religion of Ethical Nationhood and Mel Skult's uh, The Radical American Judaism of Mordechai M. Kaplan. Uh, I was originally planning to talk about uh, Kaplan and technology, Kaplan in the virtual age. Uh, I, I thought to do an experiment on Kaplan uh, and what would Kaplan look like through the prism of uh, new media, new technologies, new communication technologies. Uh, but in doing my due diligence, uh, and, I, and I figured that I would have a couple things to say about Kaplan on technology. Uh, it wouldn't be that interesting, and then I would move on to do something uh, more constructive. It turned out that what Kaplan actually had to say about technology, particularly in religion of ethical nationhood, uh, turned out to be, turns out to be, I think, very, very strange. Uh, here's what I expected to find. Uh, the most visible part of Kaplan's thinking about technology is the critical one, tending towards run-of-the-mill anti-technological grist. A threat to general human dignity, technology is identified with automation and robotization, undermining religion, including the religion of Judaism and its spiritual values, which for Kaplan were intimately aligned with humanism. In the early diaries, Kaplan complains about how modern day apartment life crowds out and makes impossible, uh, makes impossible the sukkah, which for him is a standard of simple, plain living, primitive, and natural. Not much to it. This is an early reflection from 1917. The line of thought finds itself as well in Judaism as a civilization, where Kaplan notes how, quote, the machine and the technological economy, quote, unquote, have upset the whole spiritual life of mankind. In the meaning of God in modern uh, Jewish religion, this is a 1937 text, Kaplan is alert politically, politically, uh, to the threat to economic well-being posed by capitalism and technology. The way technological civilization with its tyranny of the machine has destroyed equality, turning man, I'm going to have to use the gender incorrect just because I don't want to translate too much, how the machines have turned man, how technology turns man into a machine meant to maximize profits at the expense of human welfare. Writing in the 1930s, uh, very much under the impress of socialism and Marxism, uh, with his eye on uh, the Soviet Union and uh, 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 co Soviet communism, Kaplan writes a lot about machines and the need to control and humanize technology, as well as the need to humanize our economic life, or at least in terms of humanizing our economic life. Warning us against capitalism and technology, Kaplan wants to carve out a space for Judaism in technological society. As a power that makes for human cooperation, Godhood constitutes the force in the universe that intends human well-being and release from all forms of economic and spiritual bondage. As Kaplan was to put it in the religion of ethical nationhood, many, many years later, where the thought basically repeats itself. Godhood stands against the disruption or disorganization of human life introduced by the machine, representing the fund of infinite and creative potentiality in nature that allows human beings to transcend the merely mechanical. Group religion can, quote, save man for being robotized by technology. Published in 1970, the criticism of technology reflects realizations of a, re of a religious thinker that are now post-war, post-Holocaust, and post-Hiroshima, when war, nuclear war, is understood to pose a threat not just to economic well-being, but to human existence itself. Here's what I did not expect to find in terms of Kaplan writing about technology. While criticism of technology is easy to read on the surface of, surface of Kaplan's thought, we would, we, we would, we would, we would have left it at that. We could have left it at that. Uh, pretty much unoriginal. But there's a subtle, implicit way by which technological, mo by which technological models of thinking always seem to lie under the surface of Kaplan's religious and theological thinking showing Kaplan's thinking about technology in a more complex light, 
I would begin by pointing out that almost all the references to machines in the meaning of God appear in that chapter devoted to that attribute of divinity that Kaplan called the power that makes for cooperation. For all his reservations about technology, Kaplan has drawn what I think is a faint association between that aspect of godhood and the power of technology, the power of technology to improve human life. The power of technology defined as the intelligent, here I'm quoting, quote, the intelligent manipulation of psychic and social forces for the maximum for the maximum of cooperation and individualization. All of this gets more clearly presented only in the religion of ethical nationhood. The principle of ethical nationhood is not so much a sociological category, or at least not only a sociological political category, as it is an organizing cosmic life force, the principle of international cooperation forming an organic part of an expansive cosmic principle. Godhood is machine-like, actual, actualized only in part as a social force whose metaphysical function, and this reminds me of Whitehead, is pure process. The bringing of, the bringing, the bringing of physical and social forces into cooperation. In this way, I would like to present here how I think the religion of ethical nationhood acts or functions as a tool, a working tool of creation, as the rabbis in Genesis Rabbah understood Torah, a technology with which Kaplan wanted to save the human person and human society from these economic, spiritual, and existential threats posed by technology. A technology in other words, to solve the problems and the dangers posed by technology. In, so it's a circle. In Kaplan's conception, the deep and creative potentiality at the heart of the universe, that is the soul of the universe, constitutes the sense of enlarged connections and total adjustments. In the religion of ethical nationhood, godhood is identified as infinite potentiality. The monotheistic idea of one God taken to represent a dynamic and dynamizing principle or force now in sync with volatizing forces of capitalism and computer technology. Computer technology, Kaplan's writing in 1970. Godhood is a force of pure, or Godhood is force of pure potentiality that constantly upsets and conditions the actual condition of things. Instead of, presenting no opposition, instead of presenting an oppositional force to capitalism, the religion of ethical nationhood is integrated into it as world technological system. The central place to see this is in the chapter in uh, Religion of Ethical Nationhood devoted to, quote, man's sense of destiny, starting at the precise point where Kaplan talks about art. By this, by art, Kaplan meant not modern autonomous art, but rather that effort to shape human life itself into a work of art, presented by Kaplan as harmonious whole, a pattern of life, and here I'm quoting, a pattern of life that would enable us to organize our lives rationally, spiritually, and creatively. The tension, also productive, is these values, the ones that can save man from the danger of being robotized by technology. It's another quote, are themselves more technological than aesthetic per se. That is, they reflect an art based on a logic compounded of will, skill, reason, intelligence, and love. That's a quote. For Kaplan, this is the true function of group religion, and the particular group religion of ethical nationhood conceived as a part of a larger technological apparatus, one that is alive, wholly alive, with potentiality and possibility. As for human destiny, Kaplan meant self-metamorphosis. And now this gets very strange. For human destiny, Kaplan means self-metamorphosis, emergent evolution, and what gets called today in critical theory as biopower. In the same discussion of art, which now we should understand better in terms of the ancient Greek word techne, self-metamorphosis is understood as the vocation of man. 
the emergence or destiny of man is compared to the continued development of modern man from the condition of cavemen and emergent out of, quote, brute force and cunning, unquote, that is psychosocial, also moral, spiritual, and also biological. The process of this emergence, Kaplan thought, was now accelerating looking at the past four or five hundred years, and now the reader knows that Kaplan does, has, does have his eye on technologies, he pointed to the increase in population, longer individual lifespans, improvements to health, quote, the extended influence of the masses, unquote, which I take to mean mass communication, that is mass media and mass communication, although I might be wrong, um, the enrichment of mental content and the spread of democracy. These we know to be the result of technology. For Kaplan, these changes represent more than quantitative augmentation of human potential and power. Instead, they are said to mark qualitative growth and spiritual maturity, especially as marked out by moral opposition to war. These, Kaplan insists, are latent potentialities now being actualized on a global scale as man shed all vestiges of jungle heredity, unquote. A little racism there uh, uh, that reflective of the time. Uh, now it gets really interesting. Human destiny is biologically plastic and spiritually form-shifting. Increasingly self-aware and intelligent, quote, man may metamorphosize, metamorphose himself, unquote, into, quote, a larger type of creature. A creature that participates, and I'm quoting still, a creature that participates in the creative process itself, unquote, as new technological environments enlarge the field or horizon of human potentialities. Soon to possess the biological knowledge with which to change our very genetic nature. Kaplan's writing this in 1970. 1970 about the power to create and change our entire gen genetic nature and structure, able to regulate population growth, psychologically and sociologically expert to, quote, alter the organization of culture and economic life, the evolved human creature. Kaplan calls this being, by the way, a creature, not a person, would be unrecognizable to our ancestors in any way. In this conception, the human create creature takes its place as the architect or artist of his own destiny, both alive and creative, now no longer dominated by biological drives and instincts. The creature stands out as evolved human creature, self-aware of its own telos, illuminated, mature, and, quote, at one with the rest of living nature. The transformation is a spiritual one. The emergent future of human mind presented as, quote, prelude to godhood. These are quotes from ethical nationhood. The next step up, quote, a next higher empirical quality for any level of existence, unquote. Like angelic beings, the evolved human creature is one whose higher potentialities are activated, assimilated, or integrated into divine intellect, nearer to God than we are now. And here's the upshot, and this is jaw-dropping. In visionary prose, Kaplan presents before the, re the reader Jewish wisdom or religion as, quote, the metamorphosis of man into a human animal. The metamorphosis of man into human animal. Genetically altered, biological and superbiological, terrestrial and superterrestrial, could such a creature ever die? Is such a creature even human? 
the human animal could be a cyborg standing on the brink of what Kurzweil and other technology theorists have called the technological convergence, poised at the point where the human being turns into a post-human creature or a transhuman creature, if we prefer that language. But let's stick with the more radical post-human creature, not machine, but angel, not robot, but human animal, neither human nor animal, potentially and actually, deliberate or not. The slippage between evolved angelic being and the human animal metamorph both reflects and generates hybrid effects of technogenesis on human emergence. It sounds like sci-fi. What this has to do with the religion of ethical nation, one can only safely guess as follows. As described by Kaplan, ethical nationhood is a non-sovereign social political form that divests itself of war and the sovereign right to make war in an age when the ultimate technology is the nuclear warhead. Assuming the interlocking of society and nature, advanced social organization, and the cosmos, the human-animal-angel hybrid stands out as a non-sovereign creaturely being. The religion of ethical nationhood is the cosmic backdrop to this new form of cosmopolitan citizenship. One more paragraph. Regarding Judaism, then, as a civilization, to look back at Judaism as a civilization from the vantage point of the religion of ethical nationhood, we would have to read retrospectively to draw precise conclusions about its real or virtual character. Speculatively, we do so only upon the basis of the technological destiny of man as dreamed up in the religion of ethical nationhood. Kaplan understood that ours is an age of permanent rev revolution and that technology is a dynamic force of change whose energy Kaplan finally figured out how to harness theoretically towards the end of the 20th century. Stated clearly now in the introduction to the religion of ethical nationhood, Kaplan takes particular note of the computer revolution with its power to stimulate. If only he had said simulate but he said stimulate. But I'll read it in as simulate. Atomic explosions and rocket launchings and design and develop and test theoretically inventions that do not physically exist. Right? Inventions that do not physically exist, exist like perhaps Judaism as a civilization. The quote comes from Richard Hamming of the Bell Telephone Laboratories. I don't know who Richard Hamming is, but he's a genius. Uh, a thought that Kaplan wants very much to put to use for his own purpose here. Reading the religion of ethical nation, one begins to wonder if, after all, the entire program for the reconstruction of Judaism laid out in Judaism as a civilization with its conception of interlocking component features such as land, language, mores, folkways, arts, social structures, etc., was one such design program. A design program meant to simulate an invention, a creation, a form of Judaism just on the cusp of becoming virtual, or as he put it, a rope made out of sand. Thank you, Zach. Um, just be partly because uh, several people have joined us recently. Again, for questions at the end of the session, everything must be uh, in writing, uh, real or, or virtual. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what, yeah, is email real or at, yeah. Um, so note cards will pass around. Again, the email address is dan at kaplancenter.org, O-R-G, or Twitter, hashtag Kaplan Conference, or old fashioned, <laughs> as it were, text messaging at 847 404-3122. Uh, before she gets to her paper, I just want to say one thing about uh, our next speaker, Rabbi Dr. Deborah Waxman, which is on behalf of the Kaplan Center, we now have the opportunity publicly to say Mazal Tov. Uh, as many of you know, she has recently risen uh, to uh, become uh, both the president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College and the president of the Reconstructionist Movement more broadly, uh, the first woman in that capacity. So, Deborah. <clears throat> Thank you.
In April 1956, nearly 1,000 people attended a gala dinner to celebrate the 75th anniversary, excuse me, birthday of Mordecai Kaplan. And in his remarks on the occasion, Kaplan observed that for 50 years, he had been playing the Socratic role of Jewish communal gadfly in the hopes that he could talk the Jewish people into life. Kaplan employed language and rhetoric as a major strategy in his mid-century vitalization effort. With and through language, Kaplan hoped to animate and in this way save the Jewish people from the challenges confronting Jewish life. While many Reconstructionist efforts fell flat, the, the rhetorical efforts, two terms promoted by the Reconstructionist movement civilization and peoplehood succeeded in ways both intended and unintended. So this paper is going to focus on the term peoplehood. Mordecai Kaplan did not use the term peoplehood in Judaism as a civilization for the simple reason that it did not yet exist. Peoplehood was brought to speech at the 1942 Reconstructionist Summer Institute it emerged out of existing theories of nationalism, and it ultimately transcended all of them. So I want to focus on a major preoccupation of classical Reconstructionism that's frequently overlooked by, by contemporary readers and scholars of religion, and that's the status of the Jewish people. Kaplan and his closest associates were deeply preoccupied with one problem that modernity created, with many problems, but this one was the, the, a problem created for Jews and Judaism. And this was the split between being a Jew, that is status in the eyes of self and the world, and being Jewish. What did it mean to behave Jewishly if one was a Jew? In pre-modern times, these were unified and in the modern era, they became separate and, in the, for many reasons, confusing. Kaplan sought to clarify Jewish status in the modern era for Jews themselves and also for non-Jews, both individuals on the street and, more importantly, representatives of the state. And think about it. He was writing in the interwar period. Europe was in turmoil. This was a question of real significance. Key to the Reconstructionist response was a recognition that Jews living in different circumstances would define themselves in different ways. An embrace of diversity had to be central to any resolution. This resolution needed somehow to succinctly communicate critical information to Jews and to non-Jews. Any singular identification, whether religious or political, would never be solution, sufficient. And furthermore, the resolution had to be both substantive and unifying. Judaism as a civilization was Kaplan's first effort. His vision of the Jewish civilization was that it was subordinate to, but not subsumed by, the majority civilization, and it would be robust in its own right. Judaism as a civilization offered American Jews a means of preserving Jewish distinctiveness while also fostering participation in American civic life. Reconstructionist Judaism asserted that Jews could be good citizens by being good Jews. Noam Pianko demonstrates how Kaplan drew on various sources in American political thought and utilized the term civilization to equate Judaism with, quote, the highest aspirations of American and indeed universal humanita humanitarian ideals. Kaplan called his approach cultural hyphenism, and he hoped it would deflect calls for assimilation, assimilation into homogenized American Christian identity, and that it could demonstrate to American Jews a way to remain Jewish. This approach also placed Palestine at the center of the Jewish civilization and celebrated it as the symbol of the Jewish Renaissance. So Kaplan promoted this soft Zionism alongside an organic Jewish communal organization. We're not discussing that, but it's an important topic. And together, he hoped these would enable American Jews to successfully hyphenate their Jewishness with their Americanism. Through civilization, Kaplan rejected the premise that Jews in the modern era needed to choose one identity over the other. 
And he also rejected the Enlightenment claim that religion should be segregated to the private realm of theology and morality. He insisted that Jewish identity exceeded an exclusively religious definition, that Judaism could enhance a Jew's public identity. So in the 19th century, American Jews used the term race to communicate uh, this an, a religious cultural identity, and that worked very well for them, this, the, an identity that included transnational elements. But following the 1896 Supreme Court decision that institutionalized Jim Crow, race became problematic for American Jews. It suggested that Jews were something other than white, which in the American landscape usually meant black. So the la and the language that we use most often today, ethnicity, had not yet emerged as a concept. And even the term pluralism, which was popularized by Horace Callan, who was an interlocutor with Kaplan, was just beginning to emerge. So Kaplan, in his early efforts to articulate the extra-religious component of Jewish identity, turned to, and he also sought to overturn, the language of nationalism. In Judaism as a Civilization, Kaplan urged an ethical philosophy of nationalism. This is what he ultimately came to call ethical nationhood, and it's spelled out further later. And he urged this to enhance both Jewish self-understanding, to raise Jewish stature in the world, and as a curb on the aggressive forms of nationalism that were prevalent in the interwar period. There were not many footnotes in Judaism as a civilization. There's one here on these terms, and I'll share them with you, I'll share the footnote with you. The term nationhood is used in these chapters to denote a form of associated life. Nation or nationality is the group which is held together by the form of associated life. And nationalism, the national idea which approves the, that form of associated life. Now the footnote and the passages that it, an they, it annotates are tortured passages. And Kaplan was aware that they did not easily communicate his aspirations. At the 1942 summer conference I mentioned, he was the first, he was introducing uh, an authoritative platform by which to judge the principles and the program of the Reconstructionist movement. In these remarks, he spelled out that he thought the biggest challenge with the proposed platform was the discussion of Jewish status and how to speak effectively about the precarious situation of the Jews. 1942, Europe already at war, American in the war. Kaplan reiterated those categories that he had used as, in Judaism as a civilization in his efforts to develop a, a conceptualization that would accommodate a humanistic outlook and also contemporary political and civic arrangements. He was looking to foster non-chauvinistic identification and to nurture individual as well as collective self-realization. So he rehearsed again those definitions of nation, nationality, and nationhood, and he added in a recent decision by the United States Supreme Court where they defined nation as requiring definite geographic area, and so therefore kind of took his usage of that term off the table. So Kaplan put out that he preferred nationhood for its capacity to accommodate transnational components, but he was using all three terms to try to get at this complex point. But he knew none of them captured the worldwide situation of the Jews. None of them engaged non-Zionists who felt communion with Jews around the world. And none of them helped Reconstructionists respond to critics or educate potential followers. Kaplan assessed that this failure to successfully communicate the status of the Jewish people impeded the widespread adoption of Reconstructionism. And he hoped that the new platform might better articulate what he was trying to communicate and that this would raise up a mass movement embracing Reconstructionism. So a, uh, this was a Reconstructionist gathering, so there was a, a, a very vital conversation that followed. And the group gathered nine people, rabbis and lay people and educators, tried to find language that could replace nationhood and could communicate Kaplan's aspirations. Discussions suggested religious nationalism. This is my personal favorite, nationalityhood, <laughs> and peoplehood. It was Kaplan who first used the term peoplehood. He was reflecting on how the reform movement's 1937 Columbus platform embraced the Jewish people in a way that would have been unimaginable to the authors of the Pittsburgh platform. 
there was an educator there by the name of Jacob Golub, and he raised a reservation saying that adopting peoplehood to explicate Reconstructionism could be a challenge to political Zionism in its transnational uh, implications. It's important to say it, this did not cohere immediately. There was no immediate endorsement of the term by the Reconstructionist vanguard, and it appeared only occasionally in uh, Reconstructionist writings. It was only at the next Re uh, Reconstructionist summer conference that, it, it, uh, that it, it really began to appear in a coherent way. Kaplan himself gave a paper and used it in passing. He said, Reconstructionism assumes the organic unity and peoplehood of Israel. Its program calls for the realization of that unity through an appropriate overall structure and through workable types of local organization. It was educator Samuel Dynan's paper on Zionism that paved the way for how Reconstructionists and ultimately others began to use it. Dynan tamed that concern that peoplehood would compete with Zionism in its suggestion of transnational unity that might not require a paper. And he used it to advance an American Zionism that de defended the right of diasporic existence, even as it called for Jewish political autonomy within defined geographic borders. Dynan defined peoplehood. He defined it for the first time, asserting, we Jews are a historic people. Our religion and culture derive from our peoplehood, from our history as a people. And he fleshed out how this history had led to ambiguous status and understanding by both Jews and non-Jews. And he used peoplehood to clarify the ambiguity. Peoplehood connotes more than a religion. It connotes a common language, a common literature, historic memories, common hopes and aspirations, a link with the land, as well as a common religion. Jews could be members of the Jewish people and citizens of their home nations with no conflict in loyalty. Indeed, he added, particularism could add to the enrichment of American life. So this argument was the same one that cultural pluralists had been making for more than two, than two decades, but the language of peoplehood was new and it was helpful. And from this point forward, the Reconstructionists began to use the term peoplehood consistently. Milton Steinberg made use of it in his pro-Reconstructionist book from in 1945, A Partisan Guide to the Jewish Problem. And Kaplan, too, began to deploy the word. In, in The Future of the American Jew in 1948, peoplehood did enable him to speak with greater ease about the complex status of the Jews and to ensure that the discussion did not collapse into um, a consideration of Judaism solely as a religion. There, Kaplan defined peoplehood as a concrete and identifiable phenomenon that fostered an ethnic consciousness of like-mindedness or we-feeling. Kaplan was beginning to use the emerging language of ethnicity in addition to the language of nationalism to make his larger points. So I'm going to condense this next piece and just say he, he reiterated Dynan's arguments about um, resolving status, but the, 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 the new gloss that he added in, that particularism, it, was, it would be unjust and unethical to demand Jews to give up their historic peoplehood in order to enjoy membership and citizenship in the peoplehood of majority culture, but particularism nonetheless required deference to universal standards of equality and could not promote chauvinism or ethnic isolationism. Kaplan insisted that an embrace of Jewish peoplehood necessitated repudiation of Jewish chosenness. Kaplan also used the term extensively in his efforts to convince the World Zionist Organization to adopt a post state Zionism that would directly support the existence of the new state and would also foster the relationship to and the well-being of the Jewish, D Jewish diaspora. In a 1954 lecture series, which was later published as a new Zionism, Kaplan offered peoplehood, the oneness and the indivisibility of world Jewry as the basis of a new post-state Zionism. The goal of all Zionists should be, and this is a quote, to reconstitute our peoplehood, reclaim our ancient homeland, and revitalize our Jewish way of life. 
Each of these three objectives should be pursued with the end in view, both in Israel and in the diaspora, of developing such interpersonal and intergroup relations as are likely to help us become more fully human. And he continued this effort unsuccessfully through the 1950s and 60s. I want to tell you one anecdote and then I'll end. In the early 1960s, the Reconstructionist movement was granted indirect credit for the creation of this term peoplehood. There's a lot of evidence that it leapt fairly quickly into the Jewish lexicon. In 1961, a new edition of Webster's New International Dictionary included the term and it listed Time magazine as the source. Ira Eisenstein wrote to Time and asked and they replied that the term was used in their 1961, June 1961 profile of Mordecai Kaplan on his 80th birthday. The short time piece identified peoplehood, not civilization, as the centerpiece of Reconstructionism. So, so in our day, peoplehood, which we know permeated the Pew study, must be reframed. Peoplehood is widely seen by individuals and organizations alike as an end in and of itself, rather than as a means to an end. This is counter to both classical and contemporary Reconstructionist aspirations. I believe that Jewish leaders and institutions need to make clear that belonging to the Jewish people is a means toward being deeply and fully human. And the point of being Jewish is that we are here to on earth to live lives of meaning and connection to each other, Jews and non-Jews alike. So after Kaplan, we must assert that belonging to the Jewish people is a means toward living in partnership and building with others a just and ethical world. Thank you. That's terrific. Um, keep the questions coming. We'll start with one for Rabbi Gluck. Um, you stated that Rabbi Ka Kaplan spoke about creative arts and a creative aesthetic as important, of course, and uh, but, but or maybe but of the arts is done primarily at least by individuals. What about art created by a congregational group for the purpose of community building? She, and the questioner says Western civilization seems to separate these two types of creation. Well, well there right? are great examples, but not many of them that do exactly that. Uh, Liz Lerman right here in DC does it at Temple Micah. Uh, using dance to engage the whole congregation in a you know, kind of collective process of, ex of experimentation and expression. Um, but when I try to make a list of how many other places things like this have happened, uh, it's kind of short. And there's uh, part two. How much better would a congregation's board work be if the board sang a song or made a collage together? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Well, as a rabbi who's worked for several boards, I'm not going to touch part of that. Um, you know, I, related to, to, to Deborah Waxman's closing comments, you know, the part of what Kaplan thought about the arts wasn't just about building a sense of group and group identity, but it was about um, building the fulfillment of the individual and the betterment of people both as individuals and, and, and the ability to work together, not only the sense of common purpose. So I'm not sure singing Row, Row, Your Boat ashore would achieve that, but, um, but yeah, that's the right idea. Great. For any or all of you, um, is the sense of Jewish peoplehood in your view declining today? And if so, what is the impact on Kaplan's um, thought given or the, the future of Kaplanians, the, the Kaplanian agenda and Kaplanian ideas in light of the centrality of peoplehood to his thinking. I mean, I'll, t I'll, st I'll start. Yeah. The, you know, 15 minutes is not a lot of time. So some of the points that I would make if I had longer time was that the original aspirations of both civilization and peoplehood um, and how they were, um, some of them fell flat, that peoplehood was always about a means to an end, never an end in and of itself. So what do we do with this reality where um, for many people it is an end? I, I don't know that. The Pew study, 94% of the respondents to the Pew study said that they felt proud to be a part of the Jewish people. And this is in an, an incredibly open environment when people have, um, that, that's a choice. Uh, so I don't know that it is 
declining, I, but I don't know that it is sustainable in the, um, in the current environment. And that I was very disheartened that two weeks before the Pew study came out, the National Foundation for Jewish Culture announced that it was closing its doors. Because I think that we religious leaders have a lot of work to do. I mean, people are voting with their feet. Um, and if the synagogue is the primary place to build up Jewish peoplehood in America, then there's a lot of work that we have to do on the synagogue. And if it's beyond the synagogue, then there's a lot of work that we have to do. And, and ideally, we have structures and agencies that help to support us. Other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Shaul Magid's book on post-ethnic Judaism is, is very, very interesting and speaks to a lot of these points about the way uh, Jewish ethnicity uh, doesn't work today or doesn't function today in the same way that it would have functioned, let's say, in Kaplan's generation during the second, genera second, ge second generation American Jews. Uh, I, I think it's a case probably though the king is dead, long live the king. Uh, that is that Jewish peoplehood as it existed no longer is going to exist very, very much longer, but it's going to emerge into something, something different and something else. Uh, so I don't think it's something that's, I mean, that, that's just my sense. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plastic thing and it's a form shifting thing and it's something that becomes it isn't it, it's not as if it is it, it's something that becomes uh, over time under new conditions just to quickly tag something onto that um, you know the you know we never promised you a rose garden um, uh, <laughs> I have no idea no idea what the Jewish future may look like and somehow to worry about that strikes me as the wrong way to spend one's time but you know, to rather think, so what can one productively do and engage? And the challenge as a reconstructionist is, so whose house are we thinking about? On one hand, is it the reconstructionist's house, which needs a lot of attention, like as do all the houses. Um, but the other is, you know, at this point in the game, you know, does being a reconstructionist movement mean, and somebody referred earlier to the Chabad model, does it mean somehow, and I've now, we don't want to go there narrowly, but you know. But what does it mean then to serve the Jewish people for what we have to offer? And it's totally unclear to me what, what, what where one should focus. Except yes. If I could jump in one more time again, something I cut because of time um, is to raise up Jack Cohn again. Jack Cohn wrote about Kaplan's concept of peoplehood in the in the 1950s, and he said it was. Um, it was always prescriptive and as yet unproven, and that speaks to Zach's point about the plasticity and how it is that we invest in it. And I think one of the things that's most interesting about culture, the cultural perspective that's invited by understanding Judaism as a civilization, is the incredible generativity and, and how, how hard it is to know where things are going to burgeon. I'll just say one thing that's maybe political. Uh, I think current attempts to shut down Jewish discourse and the permissibility of Jewish discourse and what could be said in Hillel's, particularly in relation to Israel, uh, will not contribute to that kind of generativity, but will only contribute to or reflect a kind of degenerativity. By the way, Kaplan thought that one of the reasons the arts were useful is that Jews crossing all political and religious boundaries could actually find something in common. Right. Um, I have to just interject very briefly apropos uh, Zach Braderman's comment about Shaul Magid. We actually thought about having an entire panel on Shaul Magid's <laughs> recent book and Kaplan, and indeed we're going to devote, I think, a whole web page to it. It's a fascinating uh, way to approach certain issues, but that's for later. Um, next question for Rabbi Dr. Waxman. I'm going to reformulate this a little, and I apologize because I had to step out for a minute, so you may tell me that this was already answered, but I missed it. Um, was your distinction between peoplehood as an end in itself and peoplehood as a means to an end more descriptive or normative? And what, I mean, are you, do you see a place for some sort of, I suppose, non or less chauvinistic peoplehood as an end in itself? I'm up. Would I answer differently if I weren't being recorded? I mean, I think as a moral leader, Are I have a res <laughs> uh, streamed even. I, I mean, as a moral leader, I want to say I want Jewishness, being Jewish, to mean something, and I want Judaism to be to mean something. So, 
Um, do I think that a Jewish identification completely stripped of content or values is meaningful? I'm not certain. Uh, I, I am certain that's not what I'm going to promote or be working toward. I'm going to be promoting and working toward uh, an expansive uh, and inclusive uh, understanding of how to be Jewish um, and what it means to be Jewish. But I, but I think it's going to be with content and with values. I guess the only corrective or the only critical question I would have is that Kaplan thought that Judaism was self-justifying. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflects very much somebody uh, who was thinking for that generation coming, coming to age in the 1920s and the 1930s. And, and maybe, maybe for us today, uh, uh, Jewishness and Judaism can't simply be uh, uh, self, as self-justifying and self evident as, as, as was the case for Kaplan? I, I think that that's exactly right. That I, I think a lot about that from Kap, Kaplan's commitment to pragmatism. And he often said, I'm not interested in answering the why questions, including why should Judaism continue to exist. I am interested in demonstrating how Judaism could exist in a relevant way in the 20th century. Um, and I don't think that um, even as I very much resonate with Kaplan's pragmatism, and there are elements of that I'm interested in, in continuing very, very seriously, I don't think that we have the luxury of refusing to answer the why question. And the fact of the matter is he answered the why question all the time in his writings, even if he didn't do it head on. Bob, did you want to? <laughs> yeah, my last rabbinic school in 1989, I was an intern at Klal. And one of the things that Yitz Greenberg was working on right then was about the idea of Jews in age of having power. Um, and the, one of the dilemmas of nationalism historically always has been this, this, I don't know, this tilting thing where, you know, there's the, the Kaplanian ideal of somehow the, the, the Jewish content would somehow tip the scale towards towards justice and universal, universality and caring and compassion and all that, but the history of nationalism don't look so good and has been bad for Jews. Uh, and what, what Yitz was teaching them was, well then, in this age, when Jews are not on the receiving end of, of, of abject powerlessness, um, and where there's an Israeli state that has power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where Jews have money across this culture. Um, how do you somehow balance that out um, um, with content, with self-consciousness, which needs to be in a really elevated kind of way? So the kind of Judaism that we need to talk about is one that is inherently about its, its ethical content and not just, you no, know, ethnicity is gone, nationalism is scary. So um, we're going to break just a little bit early. We have no more questions right now. A couple of very important announcements. First, a lot of people, of course, are asking about the snow or the expected snow. Barring a truly unforeseen disaster, the presenters and I and the staff will be here tomorrow morning <laughs> as, as scheduled. Um, Talk to me uh, privately if you want my best advice, depending on where you're coming from, is how to get there. Um, the metro to the Marriott, the Key Bridge Marriott shuttle, five minute shuttle ride here, uh, again, barring really unforeseen circumstances, conditions, should work. So obviously, if you're not comfortable coming, we hope you'll web you take advantage of the webcast and watch, and you can even ask questions um, while uh, in real time uh, while we're streaming, but uh, we will be here, uh, again, barring a disaster beyond all prediction. Um, I know it's late, and I know uh, some of you are probably getting a little antsy. I got to tell you, you want to stay around for the next and last panel. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Uh, not that this one wasn't. So uh, please, if, if you can stay, stay. Uh, we'll reconvene at, uh, at 4.15. Thanks for the weather update, by the way. I'm trying to figure out what time to get this hopefully out of here by car tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of snow tomorrow here, but I don't, you know, what's a lot of snow?